So the source for all of this is, of course, the Quran itself. And I want to go back and see what the Quran itself has to say about these two higher types of knowledge. The Quran is the speech of God. It's also speech about God. In fact, it's entirely about God, and the other themes simply exist there to elucidate its, <coughs> its central concern. But how is this Quranic God to be known? Well, the God that the Quran proposes cannot be known directly by the rational faculties, whether these be um, ratiocinative or perhaps um, sensory <coughs> faculties who can't see or feel God. This is obvious. And the best known proof text for this is um, Surah 7, verse 143. Um, and when Moses came to our appointed place and his Lord had spoken to him, he said, My Lord, show me yourself that I may look upon you. He said, You will not see me, but look at the mountain. If it stands still in its place, then shall you see me. And when his Lord revealed his glory to the mountain, he sent it crashing down. And Moses fell down in a swoon. And when he woke, he said, Glory to you, I turn to you repentant, and I am the first to believe. In other words, you can't see God. One of the great um, revelations on Sinai is that God does not reveal himself in, in that crude way. So what does this tell us about our ability to know God? We cannot perceive his essence. It's simply too glorious. A famous hadith tells us that God is concealed behind 70,000 veils of light. And were they to be lifted, the flashing lights of his face would destroy anyone who looked upon him. However, we can know him through his attributes because they're around us to see quite clearly. Um, we can deduce conclusions about the attributes of God from the saving events recorded in the Quran, what he does with his prophets and uh, his, his chosen ones. But also, and even more conveniently, God actually names himself in the Quran. Several prophetic hadith indicate that God has 99 names. These are in the Quran, but they're scattered about. You won't find one chapter that, that dishes up the 99 names of God. Um, but early generations lost no time in assembling these and meditating upon them. Um, some of these affirm the moral character of deity. For instance, the Quran says, God is compassionate and merciful. He is the loving kind. He is the just. He is the clement, etc. Others point to more abstract metaphysical truths about God. For instance, in the famous closing verses of Surah 59, he is God besides whom there is no other God, knower of the visible and the invisible. He is the compassionate and merciful. He is God besides whom there is no other God. He is the sovereign Lord, the holy one, the source of safety, the keeper of faith, the guardian, the mighty, the powerful, the proud. Exalted is he above any partners they ascribe to him. He is God, the creator, the originator, the fashioner. His are the most beautiful names. All that is in the heavens and the earth glorifies him, and he is the mighty, the wise. So immediately we see in the Quran a distinction between the moral and metaphysical qualities in God as disclosed in the names. But a further and related distinction also imposes itself. This divinity, Allah, is axiomatically one. This is the, the primary message in theology that the Quran gets across. He is one both in himself, and this is the name that is applied to this aspect of the divine unity, al-Ahad, one unified, unique, uh, unitive creator, al-Ahad, and he's also one as he relates to creation. This comes from the same root, has different resonances, al-Wahid, So this oneness has a dimension of transcendence and it also has a dimension of immanence. Uh, remember I mentioned briefly this distinction between uh, tanzih and tashbih. With John's permission I'll expunge these. Uh, have you all taken these down? Yes. Okay. Clear a bit of space here. Tanzih refers to the divine transcendence, the unique, high, unknowable deity. Fundamental term in Islamic theology. And 
the term in which it exists in a kind of dynamic tension is teshbih, which is the divine immanence. So if you look at the handouts, um, I've dug out a few Quranic quotes here. The first one, God is beyond everything that they describe. Can't be put into words, the unknowable God. But wheresoever you turn, there is the face of God. That's the, the second register of, of the divine oneness, which is teshbih. Um, so we find in this first register, Tanzir, that the prayer, the five daily prayers of Islam, the salat that happen um, in the mosque, emphasize this first register. The keynote of the prayer is this constantly repeated phrase, Allahu Akbar, the non-comparative um, comparative, God is greater, hmm, which is referring to the, the divine transcendence and God as Al-Ahad. In other words, he is greater than whatever we can assert about him and greater than any conceptualization that we might have of him. So this divine transcendence is written into the most fundamental devotional practice of Islam and it's also a key Quranic postulate which emphasizes the gulf between the absolute and ever-living God on the one hand and the relative contingent nature of creation. Between the two, there is no um, commensurability, no common measure. In the second register, we find the Quran balancing it with some clear assertions of the divine proximity. I mentioned one from this, this handout. We also find, for instance, famously in Surah 50, verse 16, we, i.e. God, are nearer to man than his jugular vein. In Surah 8, verse 24, God stands between a man and his heart. Verses speak of God's hand, his face, and so forth. Uh, these anthropomorphisms are, of course, to be understood only metaphorically. And the Quran also introduces a concept which is the unfolding of the tashbih, of the immanence, which it calls baraka. I don't know if some of you got to see a, a movie that appeared two or three years ago by Coppola, which is called baraka. Um, it was shot in 70 mil, and really to get the impact of it, you have to see it on a proper big screen. And it's a, a narrativeless sequence of incredibly beautiful images that attempt to convey, in as much as the silver screen ever can, the sense of the sacred. This idea, as we look, for instance, out of our windows here at Darul Islam and see this staggering scenery, that there is something infused into the natural world that is not of this world, but that recalls the, the presence of the divine and invites us towards it. And this concept of baraka is a key Quranic term. And in fact, Coppola noted um, that he'd borrowed this term specifically from the Quran and from Islamic spirituality. Um, the usual translation of this term is blessing or grace, but that doesn't exactly get across the almost electrical quality of this, uh, of this um, force. Now, the Quranic view of the natural world is precisely that it is a locus of baraka and a locus of theophanies, of manifestations that recall and point to the, the divine source of everything. The world is an endlessly complex, exquisite unfolding of the 99 names. The existence of the world is other than God. Islam does not go in for Hindu-style pantheism, equating the world in any sense with God. No, the tanzih is always recognized. However, the wujud, the being of the world, does partake in an ultimately inexpressible way in the divine nature in as much as the world is a kind of shadow of, of God. That's the most that can, that can be said. Um, so we find, again, in this surah that uh, I pointed out, um, wheresoever you turn, there is the face of God. So this tension between the moral and the metaphysical attributes of God, seen differently, the divine transcendence and the divine immanence, is the most fundamental of all of the Quranic postulates. And it underlies, underlies most of subsequent Muslim theological and also mystical reflection. Theologians obviously focus their attention on the register of Tanzi, the divine transcendence, whereas mystics are interested in the divine immanence. But in fact, if you look at the literature, you'll see that neither was fixated on one to the exclusion of the other. And it was typical in medieval Islam for mystics also to be theologians. 
theologians also to be mystics. Ghazali was the most obvious um, example of this. So you'll find in the theological tracts, flashes of mystical insight come in. Also, the mystics um, will be happy to, to introduce um, formal theological themes. Now, this tension dictates the key features of Muslim theology, and you won't understand why Muslim theology is the way it is without understanding this, this dialectic 